Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. I uh, hope everybody had a great um, hope everybody had a great holiday break. Um, ready for a new uh, new semester, spring of 2019. Continuing the second half of our 90th year celebration. Um, we've got a fairly short program today, and then uh, Dr. Brian Inbody from Neosho County Community College is going to do a uh, presentation on the pursuit of happiness, um, which is going to be uh, it's going to be outstanding. I've seen it before, and it's um, it's 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 engaging and in, enlightening. Um, but before that, we have a couple of pieces of business we need to take place um, or take care of. First off, it's just going to be me today. Dr. Dr. Haas is under the weather, so you're stuck with me all, all morning. Um, first thing off, let's do introduction of new staff. And we'll get right into that. And we will start with Department 1. And Debbie, it looks like they're all your folks. Debbie? Please stand so everybody can get to know you. Hold on, Todd. Todd, hold on. Yep, take it up to him, right. please. Thank you. Well, this I think it's also being streamed, and if it's being streamed, they can't. They can't. It doesn't pick it up. Sorry. Um, as I said, with the ADM program, we have Terry Mirbido. Did I do it right? Close. And Humda Riley. Good. And then I'm going to also pass off to Sandy. Sandy has two new people. In the practical nursing program, we convinced Nicolee Wyman to join us. She was part-time last semester. She came full-time. She's our simulation coordinator. And then we have had Kim Allwright join us as a part-time faculty member. Okay. Thank you. Let's give them all a hand. Let's give them all a hand. <laughs> Hunda and Terry didn't stand up. I think they should uh, be. Oh, yeah, they you did. You you stand up. You've got to stand up so people can see you. I have my you. back to them. Okay. Uh, department 2, uh, Jolene and Cynthia. Who's okay. going to? Uh, Jolene's going to introduce this one. Jolene? Department 2 is excited to have Brad Hallier joining us as full-time journalism. Department 3, Dr. Widener. Um, Joe Stropes. <laughs> I met Joe Stropes. Jo Joe was here in the fall, so we introduced Joe, I thought, in the fall. Oh. Okay. But that's okay. We can introduce we'll her introduce again. Her again. Joe, are you here? She's out, she's outreach speech, so she may okay. not be here. Okay. All right. Joe Strokes. We will introduce her again. Is teaching public speaking for us. Uh, this is her second semester, and we still love her. So <laughs> we're happy to have her. All right. Department four. Dr. Paramore. Tremaine Ingram. I don't think she's here with us, is she? Good morning. Uh, our only addition since the beginning of the fall semester is Tremaine Ingram uh, teaching math outreach, and I think she's at the high schools today. So, yeah. Give her a hand. <laughs> Department 5, Public Safety. Bobby. I feel like I'm being interrogated. Department 5, we have two employees. We have Ashley Keene, who is back as our EMS full-time logistics technician. We're happy about that. Our other one is that we have a fire science trainer uh, teaching in the high schools, Mike McCandless, and he's actually down at Campus High School right now teaching. Okay. Great. <laughs> Rimmer Learning Resource Center, Brad. Many of you may already know Paula Freeman, but she became our new evening supervisor this past fall. Workforce Development and Outreach. Uh, 
Steve, you've got, got a handful of folks here to do. Um, so I'll start with Dave Mullins. Uh, Dave is our Director of Business and Industry Training. I'm not new. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a couple of people in business and industry. We've got Charles Chambers. Uh, he's not here today. He's, at a, he's, doing some he's in some training himself. He's going to be our, one of our trainers at our, uh, the Spirit Aero System training that we're doing in Wichita. And Josh Sant uh, is new. He's also not here. He's, he's busy doing some training himself. So uh, he's with the Safety Academy. He's doing mine safety and OSHA safety. Our coordinator of the Newton Center has an announcement. Good morning, everyone. Um, Jackie started with us as a work-study student, and then she became our evening secretary. And who better to serve as our new Newton advisor than Jackie Gooch, our alum? So. Finance and operations, Julie Blanton. Thank you. Good morning. We have a number of people, of new employees rather, in the facilities department. So if you are here this morning, would you please either stand or wave so we can see who you are. They are Duke Bergey, Donna Chase, Travis Morrissey, Jeff Schroeder, Carla Stuber, and Brad Winger. And then in our hum oh sorry, go ahead. And then in our Human Resources Department, we have a new Administrative Assistant, and that is Marsha Fletcher. Then uh, Student Services, and Mr. Bright is not with us this morning, so Nathan Butchie is going to introduce these folks. Well, is that too much to ask, Nathan? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Why don't you introduce your person, and, we'll f and I'll introduce the other one. How's okay. that sound? Well, we have a new person in financial aid that came in October, uh, Marcella Velasquez, and she's a financial aid advisor. Then we have a new administrative assistant, professional proctor in the Student Success Center. And Abby, I'm going to apologize right now. Her last, and it's Abby Van Schenkoff. 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 Abby, stand up. <laughs> Thank you. And then last, we have athletics. We have uh, offensive line coach and run game coordinator. Anybody here from athletics? Who wants to? Huh? Is it Far? Yeah. Alex Far. Offensive lines coach and run game coordinator in athletics. So let's give Alex a round too. All right, that gets us through that piece of it. The next thing we always do is an employee of the semester. And Mr. Mantooth, if you'd come up, I'll let Brooks take it from here. Good morning. Good morning. All right, cool, very good. First item of business today is Critical Monday, so if you are a supervisor and you have time to approve, please get your time approved by noon. We would certainly appreciate that. Any questions about that? Okay, thank you. Employee of the semester for fall 2018, serving on the committee, we had Sharon Eichhorn. Please stand up, Sharon. Marie Janikin. Tom McCauley. Stay standing up and Corbin Strobel. There they are. Please give them a hand. <laughs> this always is a very difficult decision to make and I appreciate their work on it because it is tough to make this decision. Kudos about our 2018 fall semester, employee of the semester. The person is a very dedicated worker. They are an extremely dedicated employee and critical thinker and due to the critical thinking skills they are a financial hero because this person can figure out ways to fix things as opposed to having to buy new things so has saved the institution many many dollars 
Our employee this semester for fall 2018 is Carl Kershaw, who is a heating, ventilation, air conditioning technician in our facilities department. So please. <laughs> Unfortunately, Mr. Kershaw is not available this morning, so we will figure out a way to publicly acclaim him at some other time. We don't know yet what that will be, but thank you very much, and I know he'll appreciate it. Okay. Right. Thank you, Brooks. Okay. The next thing on the agenda is some, are some campus updates, and I think what we will do is um, start with Julie Blanton. Julie, you want to come forward and talk a little bit about... Uh, the surprise we have coming up this week. If you have had an opportunity to look at the agenda, by the way, Carter's right, I, I can't hardly see any of you. But um, if you've had an opportunity to look at the agenda, you'll notice that there's a mention of an active shooter drill. For those of you that have not been involved in an active shooter drill before, the anticipation is scarier than the actual drill itself, so please don't, um, don't get overly excited about it. What will happen is you will get an, an alert either over your cell phone or through your Cisco phone that's on your desk, and it will tell you at the time that it's an active shooter drill. And it will say drill, but when that occurs, then we want you to lock down in place, and then when you receive the all clear, then you'll just... Um, leave your safe area and then you'll just go back to resuming work as normal. Um, it doesn't last very long, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. What we do is we bring in the police department, Lieutenant Burley and some of his men from the Hutchinson Police Department will come through. They'll be walking through the buildings as we are in the drill. So if you are locked behind a door and you feel that the door, you hear the door handle being shaken or you hear a sounds outside, that's probably them walking through the building to see. They're checking to see how well do we secure ourselves, are we hidden behind locked doors, or are we in places that we can't be seen. And so if you see um, people kind of striding through, don't be alarmed, that's their job, that's what they're there to do. It's going to happen sometime, I can give you, I'm not gonna tell you exactly when, but I can tell you it's gonna be sometime in the afternoon on one of the days this week. And um, I guess before I leave, does anybody have any questions? Yes, you will get cell phone alerts. I will tell you that the cell phone alerts, um, how quickly you receive a cell phone alert is based primarily on your carrier. So don't rely, if you're at a desk that has one of our Cisco phones and it comes across there first, I'd say use that. The last time we had a drill on my own personal cell phone, I got the all clear before I got the shelter in place and it was 10 minutes after the entire drill was done. So, and, and, the, and to be honest, that's one of the things we want to know. If, if you do, my carrier's Verizon, by the way. If you do have, um, Issues like that, that's one of the things that we keep track of when we do these drills, is how long did it take people to get the information, how long did it take them to get the all clear. So if you have anything wonky like that, please let us know, that, that helps us in our preparations. Okay. Um, the next thing we, uh, that we want to talk about uh, during the campus update is a new technology that's going to be available for faculty. And Andrew's coming forward to uh, discuss this. It's called Lightboard. Um, and I guess you're ready to go? Ready to go. Okay. If I can spell instructor, we'll be good. I think you know where you need to be? Good morning, I'd like to show a short video. Um, many of you know that both Bobby and I teach in the media department, but part of our responsibilities also include uh, working with IT. Um, and last year, <coughs> excuse me, online ed um, had come to us to ask about creating a, um, a resource that would help instructors with, Lisa, which one? Uh, 
I got you. Uh, this technology thing throws me. <coughs> um, and so uh, this is a this is a way to create uh, online content uh, uh, where you would demonstrate something for a student through uh, some kind of equation. Uh, so if, do, if we have audio on this, I'll play this video. Um, and then on Thursday, um, at 1, 2, and 3, uh, anyone who's interested in, in seeing this in person, um, going through those exercises with us, uh, we'll be at Building 12 um, Thursday, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and 3 p.m. Uh, a couple people have already responded, uh, told us that they would be coming. The Light Board will revolutionize the way online education is being taught. It's more stimulating to the eyes with the black background and neon markers, unlike traditional whiteboards that show glare. Current configurations allow classmates to get in the way of learning, but with the light board, it's just one-on-one -on -one with the instructor. It's less crowded, less noisy, and you can see what the instructor is writing. Light boards are relatively cheap and easy to make, and can make the online experience look more professional. Lightboard technology elevates the online learning experience and prompts greater faculty and student learning in education. So essentially it's a piece of glass. I should wait till I get close to the mic, huh? Um, essentially it's a, uh, a piece of glass between a camera uh, and you. Um, and as you write, of course, it's going to look right to you. Um, in post-production, we flip that around so that it looks right to the student eventually. Um, if there's any questions, uh, we're happy to handle those on Thursday. Uh, unless, nope, good, see ya. <laughs> okay, thank you, Julie and Andrew. Now that just leaves you with me. So i am just got a handful of things I want to talk about. Um, just some th a, lot, a number of the things we've already covered uh, at, at some point in the past, but um, I think it's something we always want to keep front of mind, and that's the first, the first item is uh, strategic plan. I want to talk about the strategic plan, and mostly today I want to show everybody uh, where they can get um, information about the strategic plan and offer again if you have a if you have a desire to be more involved with the strategic plan and you don't believe that you are talk to Dr. Paramore um, she is the one that's that's helping to lead this effort so again if you want to if you want to get plugged in somewhere um, also all of our committees have a uh, an input point into the strategic plan and um, all, every strategic plan has some kind of working committee or operating uh, group that you can get involved in. So if you, want to, um, if you want to be more involved with the strategic plan, please see Dr. Paramore. Today I just want to talk, I want to show, basically I want to show you where you can find um, the strategic plan information. Everybody, uh, when you log in, everybody has a home group of resources. One of which is this common uh, drive. Under the common drive, there is a there's a folder called strategic plan, and under the strategic plan, there are a number of uh, folders. The strategic plan update report. This has the most recent updates that we've done to the plan, so you can go here and check those updates. That update is also out on the website. Is that correct, Tricia? So you can go out to the website and just search strategic plan and it will come up. Um, if you want to see the history of those, those updates, they're all there. If you want to know what the action plans are, you can come to the strategic action plan proposal. Um, these are the new proposals for this year. Dining, the dining service and the high school portal, and I'll cover those a little bit more in a minute. But all of the information about our strategic plan, all the work that's being done, the minutes of the meetings, the minutes of the, um, of the subgroups or the action team projects, they're all, on the way, they're all on our home drives under common. So you can go out, you can look at them. If you have questions about it, you can see each, per, each, 
project has a champion, my, first, my suggestion would be if you have a question about it, go to the, go to the, we don't call them champions, we call them advocates. Go to the advocate and the advocate will, um, you know, try to answer your questions. If you have any additional questions, you can doc, uh, talk to Dr. Paramore and she can bring it forward to the uh, strategic action planning group. And uh, we will get you, we will get any answers, we'll get answers to any questions you might have. So again, in a nutshell, this is a strategic planning process. We, we started a new cycle, a new process, what I hope to become a, uh, an integrated approach to strategic planning at Hutchinson Community College. A um, couple of years ago, two to three years ago, uh, as right after our HLC visit, um, highlighted that we might have a weakness in this area. Um, not in strategic planning, but in the process of strategic planning. And I, and I know that's, for a lot of people, that's splitting hairs, but um, I think we've always planned strategically. Um, we maybe didn't do a great job of, of systematizing it, and we didn't do a great job of, of maybe documenting everything we were doing. Here's all the documentation of everything that we've done. Okay? And I will stop there for questions. If anybody has a question, I'm not sure I can see you, but if you have a question, I'll try. Any questions? Okay, the next thing, and again, this is more, this continues on the theme of, um, I just want you all to know where this stuff is, is located. We are also um, in, our, in a cycle to do an assurance argument. Is it an update, Charlene, or is it an assurance, it's an assurance argument update? We have an assurance argument update that's due next spring, 2020, correct? Um, and so we've, again, we've continued to work on it. The, the good news we got, and I, we may have covered all this already, but if not, I'm, I'm going to cover it again. The good news we got last winter was we just have to address the changes from our assurance argument. We don't have to completely rewrite the entire argument. Um, and that is good news. We also, part of what we had, what we have to do because we did have a couple of areas, um, strategic planning and assessment specifically, uh, we have to address those in our assurance argument. How did we address those concerns? If you have any questions about HLC, all of the information that we're gathering is right here. Uh, if you have further questions, Charlene or Dr. Widener would be happy to, uh, to discuss those with you. If you want to be more involved, you don't believe you're getting um, quite enough HLC in your diet, um, please feel free. I'm sure Charlene wouldn't have any problem with volunteer help. But it's all, all of this stuff, we're trying to be as, as, as open and, and transparent as we can. If you, if you feel like you want to be more involved and you're not getting that opportunity, please feel free to see for HLC, see Dr. Widener for, um, strategic planning, see Dr. Paramore, and um, we will be happy, we will be happy to include, we will be happy to include you more. Okay? Okay. Um, staying on the HLC theme for just a moment, we, we had something happen this last fall that might have kind of flown under most people's radar, but it was a big deal for Hutchinson Community College. In October, we had a site visit by a uh, reviewer to look at our multi-site, um, our, our, our off-campus sites, to make sure that they were up to snuff, so to speak. And I'm happy to report that after they came and visited Newton and McPherson, um, they came back and said there were no concerns. And that's about the best you get out of HLC. Uh, so in other words, we had a great, we had a great visit. And that was, that was due in no small part to Lonnie Jensen and uh, Christy Torgerson who, who helped us with that, with that visit. And of course, Steve and, and Charlene had a lot to do with it as well. So, um, but the truth is, is the reason, we were, the reason we were good is because we're good. 90th birthday, um, I don't know how much more we can go over it. We're gonna continue to celebrate it. Uh, Denny, do we have any, anything on the, on the calendar yet for next, for this spring? Not on the calendar, Not on the calendar yet. We'll probably have, try to have a couple of, um, 
you know, all college get togethers or uh, come and go type events to, to just continue the celebration. It's, um, you know, 90 years only happens once. And um, the next big one is 100. That's 10 years from now. I hope all of you are here. Uh, enrollment. We'll leave we'll leave our our great I, or we'll leave our great subjects to um, lesser great subjects. Enrollment is still soft. We finished this fall semester down about seven percent. Um, right now, and I don't think we're going to finish here. I think we're going to improve on this. We're down ten percent for for spring. Um, the bright spots for enrollment continue to be concurrent enrollment at the high schools and, in, and including uh, career and tech ed, CTEC, uh, or Senate Bill 155. Those continue to be bright spots. Um, there they were up and we, can, we expect them to be up over the next, uh, next semester. The, the kind of the things we've zeroed in on that may be driving some of this pullback in enrollment um, we lost some high schools in Sedgwick County. Um, we lost four high schools. Uh, we previously were doing EMT training in those high schools. And um, Wichita Tech asked us to um, not do that. <laughs> and, and, and because it's their home county and uh, the kind of the weirdnesses of home counties and community colleges, we were, uh, we respectfully agreed to do that. Um, we were still able to retain Mays. So we were still able to maintain a handful of high schools in Sedgwick County that they were, that they didn't want to, to offer services to. The reason it's a big deal and the reason that they, that we, we, there's a process you go through to get new programs approved, and they haven't, they did not have an emergency, uh, uh, an EMT program, so they had to go through the process. We protested it. Um, Cali, Cali County, Hutch, and Butler all protested. We said, listen, we're providing the Sedgwick County market all the services they need in EMS training. We don't think it's a good use of public funds to set up a second uh, training group in Sedgwick County, we think you're just du duplicating administration and there's no need to do it. And the Tech Ed Authority said, thank you for your input. Um, WOTC can do it if they'd like. And so they, we did try to, to stop, uh, stop the, um, the train from going down the tracks, but it was to no, uh, to no avail. That we think that, that probably, there were a loss of a number of credit hours there. Um, we have a private college that is giving away free tuition. Um, and I'm not going to name the college, but it's in Lindsburg. <laughs> and it's private. <laughs> and they're called the Swedes. Um, they're giving away free tuition to a, a, a limited number, but I think it's something like between 95 and 110 students every year from um, McPherson and Saline counties. Uh, their enrollment, their freshman enrollment was up 95 students this year and, and that's a huge increase for them. We can't, haven't proven it um, statistically yet, but anecdotally, anecdotally, I would suspect that some of those students would have come to us in the past. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to compete with free and I had an old, I had an old uh, employer one time said, well, if they want to give it away, that's fine. Let them give it away until they're out of business. You've got to have, you have to have dollars to run your organizations. Um, I'm not sure how long they'll be able to, to sustain that. But at this point, um, I do believe that's had a little impact on it. The, um, we've, we've changed how we are scholarshiping athletes and we've brought in fewer athletes. Not a, not a criticism. It's just a fact. We brought in about 1% in enrollment. It, it, it equates to about 1% uh, of our enrollment. And so um, that change had an impact 
had a small impact on, on that number. And then finally, I think the biggest driver, uh, and one that we, we, we talk about a lot, but I don't think can be overstated, is the economy. I don't know how many of you pay attention to the, uh, to the employment figures. 319,000 or 312,000 jobs were created last month. That exceeded expectations by almost 125,000 jobs. Anybody who wants a job can get a job. Um, employers are hiring people just to get them in through into the door, and then they're training them. They're, they're just giving them the necessary skills to do what they need. They're not preparing them for the next step. They're not preparing them to move up. That's where we will come into play. Um, I only jokingly, partially jokingly, say we're just waiting for the next big recession. Um, we're the only industry I know that actually cheers for recessions. Uh, but it, it, it's true. When, when business and industry is, is running at such a clip, st students coming out of high school can get what they believe are good paying jobs. People who are in positions now don't feel like they have to retool and retrain or continue to increase their skill sets to be employable. So I, I, we, we, we've, you know, Community colleges have been around for over 100 years, and, and there's very much a correlation between the strength of the economy and the strength of our enrollment. And it, it's obviously, it's, it's uh, negatively correlated. So I believe, those are the, I believe those are the biggest factors in why our enrollment's soft. Now, with that said, that doesn't matter. We still have to do everything we can to try to continue to, to keep that enrollment up, to attract students, you guys are doing it every day in the classroom. You're providing a quality product, a great education for these students. Um, Corbin and his folks are out every day beating the bushes for new students. Online education is out putting product on, and I know we're putting classes out for students. Um, Denny and marketing are working every day to try to attract students. But we all have to remember, each and every day, it's our job to make sure that students have the experience that they want when they come here, and that they get the value for the dollars they're paying so that the next person that they tell about Hutchinson Community College, they give them a positive, they give them the positive story. Um, I remember seeing a study somewhere that the number one impact, and, and there's studies that will disagree on this, but one of the inf number one influences on what makes students pick a university or a college is did their, did their siblings have a good experience and did their friends have a good experience? So I think we're doing the right things. We just have to get through this. I keep telling the uh, President's Council, I just want to find the floor. I just want to find where we're going to drop to because then we know what we're kind of where we're at. Um, and I hope we're getting close to it because it does have an impact on us uh, financially. So keep doing the good work. Uh, we'll, we will, uh, you know, strong organizations will weather storms, and we're strong organizations. So we just have to push through this and get to the next, uh, get to next year, and hopefully it'll be up 10 percent. The next, that brings me to the next, my next favorite category, which is the state of Kansas. Uh, let's see. What did I write down? Okay. Well, so I was going to start with a positive. Let me see. There's a potential for increased funding. I'll start with the positive there. The Board of Regents has made a request of has made a request for legislative uh, for their legislative um, funding proposal this year to add $25 million to the community college funding stream. Um, and what that $25 million would do is partially, <laughs> this, is the, this is wordsmithing, partially fully fund, <laughs> I'm going to contort that one, partially fully fund the funding formula. And the reason I say partially fully funds is it, it would still leave those colleges who are 
not being fully funded by the formula, it would still leave us short. Uh, I'm sorry, those colleges short. Um, because there are some colleges that are currently being overfunded according to the formula, but they would not be asked to give that overfunding back. So we would still be left short by some marginal amount, uh, marginal, four or $500,000 a year uh, for some colleges. So uh, that's a good thing though, because right now there hasn't been any new money in the system S uh, excluding Senate Bill 155, there hasn't been any new funding in the in the system for almost eight years, Julie? Is that right? Eight or nine years? And what that would do is it, it would bring, and, and uh, you're going to hear from Dr. Inbody later, later, he won't talk about this during his presentation, but uh, Neosho and Hutch have kind of, especially Neosho, he's more vocal than I am, have kind of led the charge on this. There, for eight years, there's been a disparity in funding. What we did was we held everybody harmless, so we didn't let the formula operate. And because of that, there are some colleges who are receiving less than they should be. Uh, just because we're basically, we've gone to a block grant system. This is what you got last year. There's a proviso in place that says, unless there's new funding, nobody can get less than what they got last year. So we've just continued to roll it forward. So colleges who are receiving fewer dollars than they should are continued, have continued to receive fewer dollars than they should. So positive, on a positive note, there is a potential that um, the legislature will put some money into the system. We've also asked for a restoration of the additional 4% cut. Two years ago, they gave us a 4% cut. Last year, they gave us back roughly 2.6% of that. And so we've asked for the additional 1.4% back. Uh, I don't have any idea if any of those will happen. I know that with the um, change, the, the, the election, and again, I'm not getting, going to get into anyone's personal politics. I, I think with the election, the opportunity exists for more higher education dollars. But the flip side of that is, is the legislature, I think the consensus is that especially the House got a little more conservative, so it'll be an interesting, um, uh, an interesting interplay between the Governor and the House and the Senate to see where funding actually comes in. I know that one of the, um, I believe that one of the things that uh, the platforms that Laura Kelly ran on was that she would reduce taxes on food and drugs. And so if that happens, then there will be some money taken out of the stream. I, I, your guess is as good as mine where it's going to go. I think the possibility exists. But I do think that this is going to be a more difficult legislative session potentially for community colleges um, because there are some legislators who are shining a bright light on some of our fellow community colleges um, and questioning why their taxes are so high. Uh, we have fortunately avoided that bright light, um, but I think it's because our I, I think it's because our board has done a great job of, of maintaining our our tax levy. Um, we've been able to continue to do the things we do by tuition increases and uh, valuation growth that we really haven't had to increase in our mill levy much. But there's a, there's a couple potential proposals out there that could cause us some problems. One is a property tax cap or a tax lid. And how that would function is anybody's guess, but if it functions the way it does at um, the county and the city level is they, there's, a, there's an interest, there's an inflation rate that they apply to it that says you can increase your, you can increase your collections by no more than this is interest rate, not your, not your mill levy, your collections. So what happens is as your valuation grows, if your valuation grows faster than that, that amount, you'll actually have to lower your levy to stay under that amount. So it's a, um, it's a potentially, a, a pro it's a potential problem for, for community colleges. Another potential uh, way they could do this is rather than work on the levy piece of it, uh, and what a lot of states have done, and Kansas is really kind of lagging in this area, 
they can put a restriction on how fast valuations can grow and say and they can they can say that valuations can only grow at CPI except for new additions um, and then that keeps your valuation from growing any faster so if you want to collect more dollars you have to uh, actually raise the mill levy the thing the legislators don't like is what they call stealth tax increases and that is if we just hold our mill levy flat we say we haven't increased taxes but your valuation's gone up, so we have increased taxes. And they don't, they don't like that. They, they feel like we're not, being, um, we're not being transparent with the public about it. So those are, that's one thing. An another potential is um, they may change the way we can use student fees to scholarship students. Uh, if that changes, that's a game changer for, that's a game changer across the board. Uh, I don't know whether that one's going to get any traction, but I do know that it's on, again, it's on at least one legislator's radar screen. So they would like to see how we, how we scholarship students using student fees specifically change. There is a, um, there's a proposal that um, concurrent education be ta the, the payment for concurrent education be taken over by the state similar to the way they did um, Senate Bill 155 for a handful of classes. They're talking about just five classes, not all concurrent education. The problem is, is what they want to pay and what we want to collect are two different things. Uh, imagine that. They'd like to pay half of what we'd like to collect. So we're going to try to find some middle ground. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great proposal. Because right now, I think a number of students are, are kept out of the concurrent market because they simply don't have the money. We can say as long, we can say all we want that, well, we're so cheap. But to a high school student whose parents are modest income and they're working a job, the last thing they want to do is pay $300, you know, to, or $240 of their money to get a three-hour three class that they know they can wait until when they come to college and get it paid for by Pell. So I think it's a great idea. I think that we'll pick up some concurrent enrollment because we've opened it up. Um, I don't think we'll pick up enough, though, to reduce, to be able to fill that gap. So we have to continue to work with the state, um, continuing to point out the positives. Great idea, lowers the barriers to entry. Um, there's a lot of statistical evidence that if you can get students 9 to 12 hours while they're in high school, they're much more likely to compete, complete their degrees. So those are all positives. But you can't starve community colleges who are then going to just do what? Increase tuition and increase taxes to make the difference up. So, you, you know, it, it's not, it's, there's no magic solution that says if we just pay you less, you can operate with less. But I think there's a... I think there's a misconception that that's true. So it's a great idea. We, we're fully supportive of it, but not at $150 for a three credit hour course. Um, you know, we'd like to see that at, well, we'd like to see it higher than that. I don't know. You know we, we can probably make it work at somewhere around there, but other, other places can't, and we kind of are trying to, to stand, uh, stand together on this. There's also some possible changes coming to Senate Bill 155 that might not be positive for community colleges. Right now, uh, community colleges can charge fees for Senate Bill 155 classes for students. And they, um, many community colleges do. We, we don't charge student fees for Senate Bill 155. But many community colleges do, and the state is considering restricting those fees and not allowing community colleges to, um, to offer those fees or to, to collect those fees anymore. And then the last, um, the last item under the state, uh, I, mentioned the, I mentioned the restoration of the 4% cut and the $25 million. If we don't receive that, then there will probably be a small vocal minority of community colleges that will probably push to get some kind of, we call it recentering, uh, recentering of the formula, and what that would do is that would pay each community college the 
percentage that they should be being received, that they should be receiving from the formula, even though it's not fully funded, we should be, you know, there are some of us who should be receiving more because we have a, a greater percentage of credit hours and greater percentage of what the total is. Um, we'll probably push harder for that, which will make us unpopular with our, um, with our community college brethren. But right now there's about five or six of us who, um, I don't know, I, don't know, I, wanna, I wanna be politically correct about this. There are five or six of us who are underfunded at the same time there are at least that many more that are substantially underfunded less. <laughs> Again, this is all about wordsmithing, right? We're underfunded more, they're underfunded less, because they would nobody will say, oh yeah, we're overfunded. They're underfunded less than we are. And, and what that does is it puts us in an uncomfortable position of having to defend our decision to support that to our taxpayers and our students, right? Why should we support Community College XYZ getting more money than the formula says they should be getting so that we can charge our taxpayers and our students more and they get to continue to charge their taxpayers and their students less? Um, this is, a, this is, a, is really a contentious issue for many of us. Um, we're, we've been, we are good partners, we've been good partners, we're gonna continue to be good partners, but at some point we have to, con we have to start saying, why does this make sense for us to support this position? Um, and so, if you hear my name taken in vain among community college people, you may know why. <laughs> may, may just be one of many reasons. Okay, last couple of items. Okay, we have coming up on January the 20th and 21st, the Martin Luther King National Holiday. I want to encourage everybody, there are, this um, handout is out on the, um, on the counter out there. Please take one of these. If you've never been to a King Day celebration, it is inspiring and uplifting. I would, I would, if you come to one, you'll start, you'll make them an annual event. They are fun. Um, they're, like I say, they're in inspiring, they're uplifting, they have great, um, great speakers. The, there's good music. Uh, the speakers are good. There might be one weak spot. But other than that, they're, they're all pretty good. Um, so on Sunday, it's in this facility and uh, starts at 3 o'clock. On Monday, it's at the Secondary, Second Missionary Baptist Church at 2 o'clock. So please, not only yourselves, tell your friends and encourage your students. This is why one of the reasons we start classes before Martin Luther King is so that our students who are here have the opportunity to participate in this. It's a wonderful event. Um, please tell your students to come to it. And um, I, 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 I can't emphasize enough how much uh, it would mean to them and it would mean to you to come see this. You'll, you'll really, you'll take away a different perspective about, um, um, I think, what the celebration means, okay? Then finally, one of the things that we have here at Hutchinson Community College that nobody else anywhere else has is the Dillon Lecture Series. Now, I want to take a couple of seconds to talk about the Dillon Lecture Series. It's a, it's a great lecture series. I hope all of you have had a chance to see at least one. If you haven't, again, we have wonderful speakers. Uh, this is the lineup for next year. Uh, and I'm going to read them all to you. I know you can all read, but I'm going to talk to you about them. And so on February 19th, Dr. Rick Rigsby, and uh, he was, uh, he's a speaker. His book, Lessons from a Third Grade Dropout, inspired his California State University commencement speech. It actually has gone viral, and now it's had over 200 million viewers, not 150 million. So it, it's, it's inspirational. He'll, um, 
I think he's funny. I think he's, in, he, I know he's engaging. So this will be a great, this will be a great lecture. March the 5th, this is Women's History Month. Um, by the way, February is Black History Month, and, and Dr. Ridsby is Af African American. Um, so that'll be, that'll be a great honor to have him here. Uh, March 5th, we celebrate Women's History Month with Denise Kiernan, and she's, uh, her topic is The Girls of Atomic City. Um, she wrote a bestseller, The Girls of Atomic City, and it's the true story of young women during World War II who were working at Oak Ridge, Ten who were working in Ro Oak Ridge, Tennessee to create the fuel for the first atomic bombs. I guess the only catch is they didn't know they were doing it. So, uh, John O'Leary topic is called Rising Above. John O'Leary was a burn survivor. Um, he was burnt. Uh, he was burned over, I think, a hundred percent. I mean, he, I think he was completely burned uh, over his body. Uh, survived it, obviously. His book On Fire: The Seven Choices to Ignite a Radically Inspired Life. Um, and again, his tagline is Expected to Die and Now Teaching Others to Truly Live. And then finally, Freddie Lavardi. Freddie's the Freddie's the the hook for all the educators in the room. Uh, his topic is improbable to unstoppable. Uh, Mr. Lavardi is a, he's a celebrated STEM educator. He inspired the uh, the story of the spare parts, which is a science teacher. Lavardi um, led a group of Latino high school students to first place in a in a robotics contest, and uh, he beat of all people MIT or MIT. So. I, I, these are all great. These are all great lectures. They are, Robin, you're here. These are all free to a, to a, to faculty, staff, students, and I, I've you know I've been to almost every one of them for the last 15 years. I cannot tell you that there was a bad one. They're worth your time, if you especially if you like to learn about different um, aspects of uh, of the world. The thing I, uh, you know, the Land and Lecture Series is the one that sometimes this gets compared to. I like this better than the Land and Lecture Series because the Land and Lecture Series is strictly about politics. It, it's some political figure coming, speaking about politics. There's not a politician on here. <laughs> right? So, so they, these, are, these are wonderful. If you have questions, I, I know I'm going through this very quickly. They can find, they can contact Robin. This is out on the website. They can, they, you can find all the information. They're always at 1030, unless it's, um, uh, unless it's announced otherwise. So wonderful opportunity for people to, um, to go, see, go hear some world-class speakers. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. But I did leave a couple of minutes for question and answer. I'll be happy to answer questions because I am being interrogated. I'll be happy to answer any questions if uh, if you'd like to ask. No. Okay, Ryan. 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 Brian, are you back there? Thank you for stealing my thunder. Is Brian here? Yes. Yeah. Well. I would I would echo everything Charlene said. I've seen it. I've seen it myself. Uh, Brian's a great presenter. He does a, does a wonderful job with this. Brian's the happiest guy I know most of the time. But it'll be, if you, I, I would, I, yeah, please stay around and, and, um, and watch this because it's very much worth, uh, it's very much worth staying for. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Ryan.
to introduce Dr. Embody, or do you want to want to go have on a small, a short break, and then yeah, let's have a back there. Have that a sounds good. Ten or fifteen minute break, and come yeah. on back. How about a fifteen minute break, and we'll start at nine forty five.
Good morning, and Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, it is my honor this morning to introduce Dr. Brian Inbody, our presenter on the pursuit of happiness. He spent 26 years as a broadcasting instructor. Uh, before coming to uh, Neosho County as the Vice President of Student Learning, and then he has been the President of Neosho County Community College in Southeast Kansas, my hometown territory, um, since 2010. In addition to that, he's also a graduate of the Executive Leadership Institute from the League of Innovation of Community Colleges. He's also an HLC peer reviewer, and he's a founding member of the Kansas Community College Leadership Institute. And with no further ado, let's welcome Brian Inbody. Good morning. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Check, baby, check, baby, one, two, three, four, check, baby, check, baby, one. Yes, hello. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm Brian Bly, the president at the Esher County Community College. Uh, been there uh, for, this is my ninth year as president of that uh, institution. Um, uh, I was at Michigan, uh, before that I was a dean of arts and sciences uh, for a couple of years at a small community college in Michigan, and uh, I uh, actually had married, before that, a, a Fredonia, Kansas girl, uh, and we had, uh, I had uprooted her so I could find my first job in administration. I uh, gave up my soul, uh, and uh, all ethical boundaries and became an administrator, as you know, as you have to do. And um, it was great. A bell, book, and candle, a little goat's blood, and you're in. Uh, and uh, <laughs> what you can do without a conscience, folks, it's awesome. Uh, but uh, 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 we moved up in Michigan, and we lived um, right, right here uh, in Michigan. Right? You can do that if the Miss Kansas is a little harder. Uh, but here, uh, and it's uh, the snow belt. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What I have learned living two years in Michigan is if the air temperature is X and the Lake Michigan temperature is Y, it never stops snowing. Um, uh, 99 inches average in the town that I uh, lived in, yes. Um, three weeks in a row of snow, no sunlight uh, for three weeks while we were there. Uh, so one day, my wife went over to a map of Kansas, drew a circle around southeast Kansas and said, anywhere here would be fine. Uh, <laughs> mission and accomplished. So I started looking around and uh, found a college on probation uh, and, uh, who needed a vice president uh, in, in Chanute, Kansas, and we moved out there. But before that, we actually dated, uh, well, I was living in Miami, Oklahoma. I worked at Inyo a &M College in Miami, Oklahoma, at Golden Norseman. I was the broadcasting instructor then, and, uh, but she lived in Fredonia, uh, met her through my mom, who never lets me forget it. Uh, and, yeah, she set me up. Uh, and um, uh, we dated in Fredonia. Uh, if, if you've been to, him, anybody been to Fredonia, Kansas? Yeah, the big town. And so in, in Fredonia, there's a, uh, there's a movie theater in Fredonia, Kansas that was owned by the mayor. Uh, and this is a true story. Before every movie, he would get up and talk. Uh, yeah, he'd get out a microphone. Welcome to the movie tonight. We're going to watch uh, where we run through it. Uh, Robert Redford had something to do with it, but you will not see him in the picture. Uh, the loud parts are very loud, and the quiet parts are quite quiet. And it's kind of a shock when the brother dies at the end, but I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> that is a true story. Uh, he later, uh, ran off with a bunch of the city's money and an internet girlfriend that he met. Uh, so. Small town life. I should talk. I'm from, I'm from Collinsville, Oklahoma, uh, where the police chief was arrested for stealing drugs out of the evidence locker to give to a prostitute, and uh, recently the fire department burned to the ground. Uh, that's a that is the true story for all you fans of irony out there. Uh, that's a true story. Uh, so, anyway, so here I am uh, living in southeast Kansas, uh, raising my family and whatnot, uh, but as a college president, um, a lot of what I do is personnel, right? When they say 10% of your employees take up 90% of your time. Uh, the, well, a lot of what I do is personnel, and, and we don't have any money. Uh, we live in, we're working from kindergartens, right? Uh, and so we have to keep our employees happy uh, as much as we can. And so I, I began studying happiness myself, trying to figure out how can we create a more happy 
uh, workplace, right? So it's led me to some of these things uh, that I'll talk about today. Uh, some caveats. My degrees are in broadcasting. Uh, I do not have a degree in psychology or anything else like that. Uh, so don't try to play stump the chump or anything like that. Uh, it's uh, a knowledge that I've gained reading a bunch of books and uh, watching shows and whatnot about this, documentaries and whatnot. So uh, that's my caveat about it. All right? so, but here's what I've learned. Right? Today we're going to try to learn about uh, how to achieve higher morale and happier employees. Won't that, wouldn't that be nice? And what does that get you? More productivity, less mental time, less turnover, right? And uh, that's the hope. We're going to try to understand the science of happiness. We're going to try to create an environment to improve happiness and ways that you personally uh, can uh, utilize to improve your happiness, right? Um, uh, these are based on science, uh, not on, you know, crystals and stuff, right? Uh, not to say there's not science behind them. Uh, but here we go, right? So what are you going to look? So uh, happiness. So for centuries, We've been studying depression, but only recently have we turned our uh, uh, attention to happiness. And why not? You don't walk into a doctor's office and say, hey, I'm deliriously happy. For 400 bucks an hour, can you tell me why? Uh, no one does that, right? Uh, the, the science of depression, how do you remove depression, not how do you become happy? Does that make sense? Uh, solving an illness rather than accomplishing a goal. Does that make sense? And so uh, they would just recently figure out why is one person more happy than another person, right? So here's what we found so far, the science have found so far. What is it not correlated with? Money, past a certain point. What is that certain point? It looks like around household income of $50,000. If you make under that, life is a bit of a struggle, trying to pay your bills. But people who are, make over $50,000, there's no correlation between their salary and their happiness. So getting that 10% raise or 6% raise or whatever does not really change your happiness level over time. It comes back down to where it was before, right? You absorb it. Beauty. Pretty people are happier than ugly people. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? I was one of the beauty people, I can tell you. <laughs> and that's not true. Uh, why is there a multi-billion dollar uh, 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 industry and in cutting into people's faces and making it younger looking, right? Uh, or goop that you spread on your skin. This goop will make you 20 years younger. Do you think that's true? <laughs> Uh, not really. Uh, but hey, people line up to spend. You know, so beauty is, uh, you know, you're, we're all uh, eye sculptures, right? We're beautiful when you're first made, and after time you start to melt, right? Uh, it's not as pretty anymore, right? Uh, and so people who are beautiful struggle to maintain it. Struggle to maintain it their whole lives. People like me <laughs> give in a long time ago. Uh, I was bald at 20. Uh, so uh, uh, materialism, the more stuff you have, the happier you are, right? Just the opposite, maintaining the stuff and getting the latest stuff is a problem. Young people are happier than older people, right? Give money home, right? All the young kids dancing around having fun. Isn't that true? Young people are happier. Who commits suicide in this country? Teenagers, right? Young people, um, uh, they're not necessarily, in fact, there seems to be no correlation between age and happiness. Marriage, people who are married are much happier than people who are unmarried, right? We all know this, all married people, right? <laughs> right? What's the divorce rate in the country right now? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's no correlation between marriage and happiness. Uh, the happiest women in the world are women in the first year of the baby's life, excited new moms, and women in the year five of divorce. <laughs> uh, so they figured out that you can live just happily without a guy around, right? Happier than any other woman. Uh, kids, children are the light of the world and make the world a happier place. Isn't that right? Children are wonderful. 
uh, like my brother and his two uh, kids. Uh, one is a 30-year-old man who has really not left his bedroom his entire life, uh, has no job, no prospects. And his other son, 27, really excited because he just got work release uh, and is making his way through the, uh, the whole system there. Uh, it is hopefully we'll get some of those crimes cleaned up any day now. Uh, True story, right? Uh, so you never know what you're going to get with kids, do you? Uh, never know what you're going to get. Uh, and of course, situation, right? You break your leg, you're unhappy. You wreck your car, you're unhappy. Is it uh, correlated? It is, but only moderately, and also temporary, for the most part. Okay? So what is correlated with happiness? If all those things aren't, what is? So what do happy people do? They devote a great deal of time to friends and family. Right? They don't spend a lot of time by themselves. They get out and they do stuff and they're around people. Here's one of the key terms we're going to talk about. They express gratitude regularly. They are thankful for what they have. This morning when you got up, how many people had to walk more than half a mile to get your water for your morning cleanup? Not very many of us, I'm guessing, right? But there are people in this, in this world this morning who got up and did that, didn't they? Tap water is a pretty cool thing. When you don't have it, you miss it pretty quickly, right? Uh, and we don't give thanks for tap water. We expect it. In fact, when it doesn't work, we're quite angry, right? Uh, well, if you were living in one of those countries or those areas, you would be very grateful for tap water. Things like that. Uh, they offer to help others often. You know the guy that owns a truck that every weekend he's moving someone? Why does he do that? He could be watching football or whatever, right? Instead he's out moving. Why does he do that? He's figured it out. Happiness. Happiness comes from helping people, right? Optimistic about the future. They don't spend a lot of time watching the news. <laughs> Especially one or two of the news brands, right? Uh, that specialize in hatred and anger and, and depression, right? Uh, I used to be in the news business. I know. We look for things to make you scared. The flesh-eating bacteria and how you can die from it tonight at 10, right? <laughs> how many people have died from the flesh-eating bacteria? A few, a few, but die from fear? A lot, right? And so that was my job, to, to sell fear. And I did it, you know, we did a pretty good job at that, right? So you, that's what the news is job. So it's hard for you to stay optimistic when you constantly dive into negativity, right? And, and express that. I'm all cleared up about what's going on in the world. Uh-huh. And you're also negative Nelly. Uh, serious life's presence and like live in the moment, right? They love, oh, this is something new. Let's try something. Let's live in the moment. They, here's my worst one. Exercise regularly. What does that mean? It looks like 20 minutes three times a week. Uh, there seems to be correlation between exercising for 20 minutes three times a week and happiness. Something not, that's not a lot. It's not a lot. That's not people who I'm going to run a marathon. Uh, no, that's just 20 minutes three times a week. Uh, are deeply committed to lifelong both things larger than themselves, like religions and causes. What is the mission of Hutchinson Community College? Dr. Vile, do you know what it is? Yes. There you go. Very good. Excellent. So you work at a place that doesn't make toaster ovens, right? That one day are going to wind up in the landfill. Now, do not against, all work is good, right? I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying what you do for a living makes it real easy to say I'm committed to something larger than myself, right? Larger than other things. You ever been to an ABE graduation? How many people have been to an adult basic education graduation day? If you're ever feeling about, man, I really hate working here because all we do is produce paper for something. We're a, we're a credit hour factory. That's all we are. Go to an ABE graduation with me and see the difference that you're making in people's lives, right? Uh, ABE folks have had a uh, quite a, uh, one of these paths to where they are today, right? Not a straight line like our 4.0s who are then going to be senator. Uh, no, uh, they've gone through a lot in life, right? Some of it deserved. Others, the, uh, the situation uh, pressed on them. And here they are, they've made it. Uh, moms and daughters graduating together. If you're going to do it, I'm going to do it with you, 
stuff like that. It's easy for us to say, we are making a difference every day in people's lives, because we've seen it. We've seen people come in on assistance with two kids, and then two years later, they're a nurse. They're gonna make $50,000 a year, more than I pay my faculty. Uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> a true story. Uh, and now, research says that if you go to college, chances are your children are gonna go to college. So you just broke generational poverty for that family. It's better than a toaster oven, isn't it? And I don't care if your job is to teach them. I don't care if your job is to clean the room where they just learned. You're part of that, okay? And you've made a difference. You can't forget that. Yes, we have to fill out paperwork for the state of Kansas. Ridiculous study after study that's gonna sit on someone's shelf and never be read. But you know what we also get to do? We get to break generational poverty. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And it's the secret to happiness, committing yourself to something larger than yourself. And they also have the same bad things happen to them as everybody else, they just deal with them better. Remember, it's not stress that kills you, is it? It's how you deal with stress that kills you, right? Because there are people that go, oh, I just lost all my money in the stock market. Oh, well, uh, I can rebuild. It's my chance to rebuild. And there's people who jump out windows, right, uh, because of the same thing happened to them. Right? It's how you deal with stress, not the stress itself. With me so far? On we go. There are two schools of thought about improving happiness. Two groups of scientists out there, right? Always, immediately, when you start studying something, there's the Democrats and the Republicans. There's, you know, uh, whatever, right? Um, school number one, it's all genetic. You're born that way. Naturally happy or naturally grumpy people on a continuum with... Uh, you remember you ever, uh, Oscar the Grouch? You remember him from the, you know, ah, I hate life and everything stinks, right? And enjoys, kind of enjoys being mean and grumpy. And then at the other end, you remember uh, there's a show called The Middle. There's a girl in there called Sue Heck. I don't care what happens to her. She's happy about it. You didn't get any clubs. You tried out for four. It just gives me more free time to do other things, right? Uh, so she's always over here happy, and, and there's always people. And that most of us are kind of in the middle. And you're born on this continuum from Oscar to Sue, right? Somewhere in between. And so here's the bad thing. No matter what happens, so Oscar Grouch is happy because he gets new garbage today, and it makes him happy for a little while, but pretty soon, the effect wears off, and he's back down to where he was before. Same thing with people in here. I'm normally happy, not overly happy, not overly sad, and then I, you know, get something cool happen to me, right? I get to see my daughter and have lunch with her. Isn't that great? And then pretty soon, we just drift back down to where we were before. Do you see how that works? And this is your natural set point. We all have one. And you're born with a different set point. You've met these people, the people who are always happy. You know what I'm saying? It uh, doesn't matter what's going on in their life. They always have a smile on their face. How do they do it? They're born that way. This group of thought, though, is also very sad in the fact that the main researcher here said, we can no more make ourselves happier in the long run than we can make ourselves taller. That's kind of sad, isn't it? All that work. All those self-help books are crap, according to this person. <laughs> Isn't that sad? That's school thought number one. School thought number two. That's actually a combination of factors. Yes, you're born this way. About 50% of it is genetic. But 40% of it is behavioral. You can change it. You can raise your level. Or you can make it worse. Hang around with negative people watching Fox News. It won't take you long to start heading down this way and then get meaner. Isn't life suck, right? I got one guy. <laughs> we, built a, we built a fountain on campus that's really pretty. We did it all with donated money, and our guys did it. And so they wanted 300000 to make this fountain for us. And I said, that's crazy talk. Uh, and so with donated money and our guys doing the work, we did it for like 75000 That's pretty good, isn't it? It was all donated. It was beautiful. I got nothing but compliments on it. You should come see it. It's really pretty. Uh, I got nothing but compliments on it except for one guy who kept his name was Dave. Uh, and Dave liked to tell me, oh, it's just a, 
It's a mosquito farm. All you've done is create a mosquito farm. Uh, well, and the, you know, it's just constant negative stuff. So finally one day I said, Dave, is there anything good in life? I just ask him that. He's one of our donors. Uh, is there anything good in life? He's, I guess. But, you know, most things suck. You know, exactly. For him, he lives down here, uh, and, you know, and so it, 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 it makes him happy, I guess, to make other people sad, right? Well, uh, a behavioral, you can change it. You can raise it up or down, uh, and it's situational. Stuff happens, right, to everyone. Oh, by the way, let me go back. This one last thought. Uh, now the new data is out that, yes, you can raise it. The guy that made that statement, you can no longer can make yourself taller, has now recanted and said, okay, maybe I was wrong. Right? Maybe I was wrong. Okay. So uh, here's one of the problems with this whole moving around. Hedonistic adaptation. You get used to the good life or the bad life. Right? After a while. Right? Life is pain. You just get used to it. Uh, we can all get used to the good life, right? Uh, and after a while, it just becomes life. If you ate in the fanciest restaurants every meal, after a while, it just becomes a meal. You get, it's normal. But the first time you experience it, it's pretty cool. Then after a while, it's, it's old. I'll give you an example. So a buddy of mine, uh, who's from Fredonia, actually a buddy of Jennifer's, um, runs the Orpheum Theater in San Francisco where they do live theater, right? It's the biggest theater in San Francisco. It's gorgeous. And he's the head of house there. And so we were coming to San Francisco. He said, you want tickets to the show? And he said, yeah. He said, well, they're comped. Uh, so I'll get you some comp tickets. Beautiful. Mamma mia. I said, that's fantastic. So I said, what do you wear? And he said, oh, to the North End, anything you want. Come to the come to matinee, wear anything you want. So we've been out, you know, seeing the sights. We show up in shorts and t-shirts, you know. Uh, and there's people like in suits, you know, thanks. So we walk up to the window and said, um, uh, we got some tickets here, by anybody? And they went, oh, yes, sir. Uh, and this guy walks over, yes. Uh, this is Mr. and Mrs. Inbody, would you take care of them? Absolutely, sir, would you come to me? And they went, okay. Uh, and we walked over into our own private waiting room with the wine and the cheese and the beautiful view of San Francisco. Uh, and and he said, um, when the show starts, I will actually ask you to quickly follow me. Could you, could you do that for us, please? And I said, uh, uh-huh. And so uh, here he comes, he walks on, the show is starting, sir. So okay, and so we start walking in, we walk in, he got us fourth row center. If you know anything about theater, that's where you want to be. Uh, and everybody else is seated. And he said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. We sit down and the show starts. They were waiting on us to be seated to start the show, okay? And he told us, and, uh, now sir, at intermission, I need you to look right at me and follow me out. I said, okay. Uh, and so uh, lights come up, intermission. He's standing at the end of our row. He says this. I come through there. He's pushing old ladies out of the way, you know, <laughs> right? And he gets us back up to our little room where we have our wine and our cheese and our beautiful view. I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. There's another guy here. He's in a tuxedo. Uh, he came to the theater. Uh, oh, by the way, when we came to get seated, I heard, um, who is that? Who is it? Who is that? <laughs> right? They all thought it was famous. So anyways, uh, th that intermission's over. He brings us in. He sits us down. The show starts for intermission. So we were, that's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. Now, if that happened every time I went to the theater, that's how you go to the theater, right? And it would, it would just, you'd get used to it, right? This be how you do things. So how do you impress that guy after he's done that, right? So it's pretty cool. Um, but you get used to it. You get used to the good feeling. And just like you get, so you start drifting back down. Back down to where you were before. All right? As one of the lottery, a lottery winners said, happiness is hard work. Think about if you had unlimited resources, or nearly so, how would you keep yourself happy? And the answer is, you've got a problem. Hedonistic adaptation. You buy yourself a new car. You eat in fancy restaurants. Pretty soon, you drift back down because that's, all you're used to. Make sense? That maybe stuff, maybe resources, isn't the secret to happiness. Maybe it's gratitude. Maybe it's helping people, right? Um, same thing with bad stuff, right? If you only had to walk, you know, to, this week you had to walk a mile to get your water, tomorrow you have to walk a mile and a half, 
but that's what you have to do because the river change. You get used to walking a mile and a half. So even in the bad stuff, you drift back you know, and say, oh, it's terrible. I've got to walk a mile and a half now. But pretty soon you get used to walking a mile and a half, and now you're back to where you were, right? So both good and bad. Hedonistic adaptation. Here's some ways to negatively affect your happiness. Here's some things to avoid, all right? Loss of job, right? That will six months or more. And that will change your set point or lower your set point. Loss of a limb, three years. Takes a while to adapt to that, doesn't it? If you lose an arm or a leg, it takes you about three years to adjust to that. Loss of your spouse. If your spouse dies, well, some of you, yay, uh, but it's a party because I hate them. Um, I'm the one that killed them. Uh, no, uh, but no, if you love your spouse, usually five to eight years is what the study says that you, yes, your, your, your adaptation level drops you, I mean, uh, your hedonist adaptation drops you down, but after about eight years or so, five to eight years, you'll reset back to where you were before. Not so you'll ever be over it per se, but your daily happiness level will return to normal. It just takes a very long time, as you can see, to adapt to that. All right? You'll always return to the big thing. Large negative effects actually sometimes, counterintuitively, makes you happy over time. For instance, they looked at paraplegics and POWs. POWs reported being happier after they got out of prison than they ever were before they went into prison. Does that make sense? They were down here. And then they were at POW, which dropped them down here. And then they got out, which made them permanently up here. Why? Grateful. They, did, they w didn't take things like tap water and not being beaten uh, for granted. Today, you were probably not beaten today, right? Uh, well, they were. Uh, and so every day is a holiday. They understand what life could be like, right? What's the old thing about... Travel broadens the mind. Mark Twain said, uh, travel is the antidote to racism to, uh, and to gratitude, right? To, for you to understand gratitude. Because when you see how other people live, maybe you'll appreciate how you live a little bit better. We're living in a dream world compared to some people. It's hard to see that when you're not there. Paraplegics are in the same way. They appreciate motion more and things that you can do, whereas uh, before they took it for granted. Small events. Car you know, car, traffic jams, your car won't start. Taking care of the kids, uh, teenager angst. I have a 16 and 18 year old, so you know, I'm in the, in the middle of that. Uh, they have, small events have a worse overall effect than large events because they're ongoing. They needle you a little bit every day, right? Large events happen, oh no, you wrecked your car. Well, we got the insurance taken care of and blah, blah, blah. No, they got a better car now and thinks that, right? Uh, whereas teenager angst, just, just <laughs> what is she going off to university? Uh, you have that countdown on your phone. Uh, so, yeah. What's the worst thing you can do? Uh, and that is prolonged isolation. The old, I'm going to move to a cabin in the woods all by myself is a bad idea. Um, according to the research. Because without people, you start drifting downwards and you don't come back up again. This is what happens a lot to our parents that we are you know, aging parents that we're taking care of. We've got to encourage them to get out of the house, stay involved, right? When you retire, sitting in a chair and dying is not a good idea. But doing something, you know, getting out and being with people, that's going to help keep your happiness level up. But staying by yourself watching Netflix is not the secret to happiness, okay? It might seem like it at the time, uh, but no, okay? So get out and see people. All right, areas that happy people excel at that others don't. Seeking pleasure. This lasts the least amount of time on the old happiness scale. Yes, you went out and you saw a great movie, and then it's over, right? Uh, and you went back down again, right? It works, but for the least amount of time. So seeking pleasure works, it just doesn't last very long. Engagement lasts longer. Always around people, always wanting to help. That lasts longer than I'm going to do something for me, right? 
looking for meaning, something larger than yourself, being part of a cause. So getting involved with Relay for Life or whatever you want to do that you something you greatly care about. You're a teacher or work here, right? So there's a lot of students that you can help and be a part of. But if you want to do something outside, do that too. And most importantly, they, do, they, they delude themselves, right? They believe the world is a better place than it used to be. I'm going to make a suggestion to you for a book. It's called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Um, I got the suggestion from Bill Gates. Um, and it's a very long, very scary book. Uh, it's a history of violence uh, in the world, getting back to uh, you know, prehistoric times to, to now. Uh, and through research, uh, and you know, basically it's a meta-study, of how the world is such a better place than it used to be. You know what we used to do for fun on the weekends? We'd get a cat and put it in a box, and then put the box in fire and watch the cat burn to death. That was something fun to do in the Middle Ages. All right? Uh, public executions weren't just justice, they were a party. Right? Uh, torturing people, part of the deal. Right? Just how you did things. Uh, your chances of dying in a war have never been lower. All right? And that's been only true for the last couple of generations. The world is a better place than it used to be. I don't care what the people in my news media uh, tell you. It's a, better, it's a better place than it ever used to be. Polio is nearly eliminated around the world. As a Rotarian, I know this, right? That we've been battling polio for a long time, and it's nearly eliminated from the world. Isn't that cool? The world is a better place than it used to be. It really is. Um, but that's the true secret to happiness. If you believe that the world's a terrible place, then for you it is. Okay? With me on that? So delude yourself. What are you costing yourself? I'm just happy. I'm smart. I know exactly what's going on. Yeah, but you're miserable. So being smart and miserable. Right? Happiness is contagious, something that probably all of us already knew, right? But so they did a 40 year study of one particular community on heart disease. And part of that 40 year study was a mood survey. Besides all the health stuff, you know, how much are you eating, what's your weight, blah, blah, blah. They also looked at your mood and see if mood affects your heart. And what did they find out? Uh, this was a lot of data there to mine, 40 years worth of mood data. And what they found was that happiness was a virus that moved from person to person. If one person became happier, right, uh, then the people around that person, a friend or a family member, has a 15% greater chance of being happy, right? If a friend of a friend is happy, then you have a 10% chance of being happier, right? And you don't even have to know that person. Just being around happy people makes people happy. Four degrees of separation, friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, before the effect stopped. What's the, what's the lesson to be learned there? Hang around with happy people. Guess what? I'll bet the converse is true. You hang around with negative people? There's a whole book called Toxic People, uh, right? Uh, and one of the things it tells you, it, it, it agrees that there are some people, uh, Oscar the Grouch, and you can work on them all you want to, but the, we don't, I'm sure at Hutch you don't have any. But at Neosho, uh, we have one or two of these toxic people. And what the book suggests is isolation. Uh, find the office farthest away from all human beings and put them in there, uh, right? Uh, because they're mean and they're hateful and they've spread nothing but crap everywhere they go, so why not move them further away, right? Why put them in the center of faculty row? Put them over in the annex. Here's your office uh, over here, right next to the server farm. Uh, so uh, see if you can make them upset, uh, right? Uh, because that's just how it is. Um, they spread negativity. Same thing with the happy people. Put them in the center of things, because if they're happy, the people around them will be happy. Make sense? Uh, so it, did it work? The research says it will. Happiness high. Can you get high from being happy? And the answer is, yeah, um, because happiness releases dopamine in the brain. Sometimes the same amount of dopamine as cocaine. Free cocaine! Right? Uh, it 
it's legal and you won't go to jail. Uh, isn't that great? Uh, and how can you do it? Well, they, actually a group of monks accomplished this. They, they study the monk's brain and then they asked them to meditate on the concept of gratitude. One of these monks, by the way, was a PhD in physics. So they said to them before and then afterwards, after they did, while they were doing it, and of course, dopamine levels rose during this time. So can it be accomplished? Absolutely, just by thinking about how grateful you are for what you have, and where you are, the job that you have, your children, your health, things like that, right? The world you live in, the country you live in, all of that can release dopamine in the brain just by thinking about it, much less doing stuff. Okay, of the industrialized nations where they didn't have to walk a mile to get water this morning, right? The regular industrialized nations, which country do you think, according to the research, is the least happy country on earth? Say it louder. The U.S.? No. We're in the middle of the pack. Yeah, we, we have Netflix. No, I'm sorry. South Africa? No. It is, in fact, Japan. Japan is, yes, they have Hello Kitty. Uh, uh, and a guy married a hologram. Did you see that story? Uh, it married a hologram of, uh, of a girl. Uh, but uh, the reason is, work is much more important than family there. In fact, they have a word, kiroshi, uh, which means to work yourself to death. They actually have telethons for this, like the Jerry Lewis telethon, only they have it for people who work themselves to death. Um, there's a documentary you can see uh, called Happiness, easy to remember, uh, and in it, they focus on a young man who is in charge of quality control at Toyota on one of their particular plants. Do y'all remember a few years ago, uh, Toyota was going through a series of recalls, which was unusual for them, right? And this young man, uh, he was in his late 20s, early 30s, uh, was in charge of one of those lines. And you see him, some home video of him and his wife and his uh, little daughter, who's probably about 18 months, and the, he's holding her and she's like fighting to get out of his arms. And the wife says, of course in Japanese, don't worry, she'll remember you, it'll come back to her. He had been gone for so long um, that her, his daughter didn't know who he was. Um, and so one day at the plant, uh, he's on the phone, and um, uh, he's uh, getting yelled at as, by his boss. And he's yelling back, sir, I can do what you want me to do. I just need more resources. If I can have more men, more women uh, to accomplish this, I can accomplish that. And of course the boss said, no, you're going to get what you get. That's it. He hung up the phone, and he fell over dead. Now, they did an autopsy. No cause that they could find. He gave up the ghost, right? This is a common problem to the point that they have telethons about it, right? Work matters more than family. That's scary, isn't it? What do you think is the happiest country on earth? Uh, if Japan is the least happy, what's the most happy? Denmark. Denmark. That's correct. Denmark is the happiest country on earth, according to the research. They believe very much in protecting and caring for each other. Social programs, crippling taxes, and I would never want to pay taxes like that. Okay, but they're happier than you are, right? Free health care, free education, right? Communal living is a thing where you would buy a house in a part of a, let's say, a cul-de-sac, right? You buy one of the houses in the cul-de-sac. They build uh, a common room in the center of the, uh, the cul-de-sac. And then they build hallways between the houses. So you can go in and out, basically, of each other's house. And you never know where your kid's at. Oh, they're over at Frank's tonight. Oh, okay. Uh, right? And they kind of uh, care for each other. If you have a problem, say, I need some help. Everybody, okay, let me help you, right? The, this documentary focused on a single mom and her two kids moving into one of these cul-de-sacs. Everybody helped them move in. They, and then on this, in the center room, each family takes turns making dinner one night a week, 
right? Wouldn't that be nice to never, you know, only make dinner one night a week? Uh, so if you want what they're having, it's spaghetti tonight, the common room, if you want it, people show up and eat, right? And then that's it, right? Uh, and then, hey, Thursdays are my night, so I take care, we're doing pork chops, or whatever, right? So they really, really take care of each other. Crippling taxes, communal living, but the happiest country on earth. Something a bit about other people, right? And taking care of each other, being grateful. Okay, can money buy happiness? Yes! Until the needs are met, then it lowers the happiness as money uh, responsibilities increase. As the great poet once said, mo money, mo problems. <laughs> did he just quote Biggie Smalls? Yes, he did. Uh, right? Uh, mo money, mo problems. That's exactly right. So rich people is actually negatively associated with happiness. Uh, it tails off at the end, right? So if you use your money to help people and the cause you care about uh, actually uh, adds to your long-term happiness, why do people donate to the college? Especially now, they changed the tax laws. Most people will get exactly nothing for donating to the college, right? 80% will no longer file a long form, which means you get declare your, uh, but people still do. Right? We had our best year ever at, at the show this year, even the if the tax law changes, right? Why do people do that? Because it's the secret of happiness, moving your, form, your causes along, helping the world be a better place. And people who donate to the college see that happening. And that's why they want to be a part of that. They're getting happiness out of it, right? Uh, same thing, should you spend your money on a new 4K TV, or should you take your family on a vacation? Science says take the family on a vacation because you will en engage in more social interaction with them and create memories and build your happiness over time. Spend your money on bringing the family together as opposed to yourself. Make sense? Buying things adds to your happiness but only temporary, right? You're gonna get used to it. A brand new truck is awesome. And then the payments arrive, right? And then it becomes less awesome. And then someone keys it and, or, you know, scratches it at Walmart or whatever. My wife, when I got out of her car, she now parks in the last spot at Walmart uh, and walks. Every, well, it's good for her health, I suppose, but not in the wintertime. Uh, she parks in the last spot at Walmart and walks in. It's amazing. No matter where she parks, people park around her. It's like starts a trend. I don't understand. But anyways, uh, uh, so she always goes, why is the person back here? Uh, right? But, uh, so uh, it's actually adding stress to her life. The new vehicle actually adds stress to her life. Right? And so there you go. Uh, so buying things, spend the money on each other as opposed to yourself. That's what they say. Here's some ways that you personally can raise your happiness level. Are you ready? Create a gratitude journal. Once a week, spend 20 minutes writing something you're grateful for, right? Okay? Uh, and so that this uh, lasts for the whole week, is what they say. It will raise your happiness level for the whole week. And then you'll drift back down if you don't do it. But keep it, that in front of you. You have to not just feel gratitude, you have to do something, okay? Do something. And simple as sitting down and writing, here's what I'm grateful for this week. Right? Some people do this in the month of November, they, every day in the month of November, since it's Thanksgiving, they do that. What, what they're saying is, do it year-round. It doesn't have to be every day, just once a week. Five acts of kindness a week, especially on the same day, last one to two months, raises your happiness level one to two months. We used to do this thing in Miami called Hearts and Hammers, in which we get an army of people, like 150 or so volunteers, and the local hardware stores would donate all the materials. Then we break up in groups and go to houses of, of people who are older or whatever, can't take care of themselves as much, and we would fix up their house uh, for free for the day. Why do we all do that, give up a Saturday? One to two months of happiness for that, right? So doing stuff like that. Write a letter and visit someone you are grateful to, right? And read them that letter. You made a difference in my life, and this is why. And that lasts three to six months. Have you discovered something called Facebook? Uh, I have discovered that. And my, so one of my old students the other day, uh, back when I used to teach broadcasting, wrote me a long letter and put it on Facebook publicly for other people to read about, do you remember that time when you sat me down in your office and said, and kicked my bottom and said, uh, you're ruining your life, pull your head out of your bottom. Do you remember that? I didn't use the word bottom. Uh, 
I say, honestly, I did not remember that conversation I had with him. Well, you know, and then after that, I, I figured out, you're right, you're right, and I went ahead and graduated, and now I'm here today, and I attribute all that to you. Uh, oh, my gosh. Of course, he shouldn't have attributed all He did the work. All I did was give him a kick in the pants once, right? Um, and so did that make me feel good? Yeah, it made me feel good as an instructor. Did it make him feel even better? Science says he felt even better doing it. Okay, so do this for someone that you admire, someone that, that has helped you, right? Conduct a happiness inventory on a regular basis, right? Uh, you can just type in happiness inventory into Google. You're going to get about 30 of them. So pick the one you like the most. You only care about the things you measure, right? So measure your happiness. Keep track of your own happiness level and see how you can change it. Here's the hard one. Avoid social comparison. Oh, that's the toughie. The guy next door just drove in with his brand new truck. You can still see the dealer tags on it. All right? Uh, makes you so mad. Right? Is that going to happen? Absolutely. Um, but you need to avoid that. You don't know what's going on in that family. Maybe someone died and left them the money, and they used that to, they'd much rather have their dad back than that truck. Right? You don't know what's going on uh, with that purchase, right? How about the crippling debt they just got from that, right? Uh, all the Dave Ramsey folks out there. So try to avoid that as much as possible. Commit to your goals. Uh, uh, Dr. Fowler just mentioned you went over your strategic plan, the goals of the college, right? What you have. Do you have a goal sheet written down of what you want to accomplish? Do you have your own strategic plan? I want to retire at the age of 60. And here's the steps I'm going to have to do to do that. Or whatever your goals happen to be, I want to give more money to my causes, or I want to be able to, to donate more time. Those are the kinds of things you should do. Write down your goals and click them off, right? And see your work as a calling and not a job. They went to a hospital that reported to have the happiest employees in the country, and they did a study on different uh, workplaces, and, and, and they rated that people who worked there had the highest happiness level of any other business. So they interviewed the people who worked there, including the custodial staff. And they said, you're the happiest custodial staff we have ever encountered. Why? You know, you're working at custodial staff at a hospital. It's got to be gross at times. You know what I'm saying? There's bodily fluids and stuff, right? Uh, and it smells like a hospital. Uh, and so they, they have to clean it. And they asked them, why? And they said, we save lives. They were aware of the staff infection rate for the hospital. And that was their job, to lower that rate, right? Our job is to save pe people's lives. Right? And we're doing that. Okay? It wasn't clean this room. It was save lives. Your job here isn't generate credit hours. It's to break generational poverty. It's to change lives. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can see this place as a credit hour factory, or you can see it as a way of impacting people. That's up to you. But what they're saying from a happiness level, if you see it as what you're trying to accomplish emotionally, more so than, than numbers on a page, then you're going to be happier. With me so far? On we go. Change your routine. Routine is comfortable, but it gets boring, right? Alabama is going to face Clemson again. Uh, no, uh, yay for them. Uh, Hutch is going back as a basketball champion again. Uh, yeah, we're all excited for you. We won once during my presidency. We went to it once. Uh, hey, uh, you know, uh, Royals, uh, we're the Royals. Uh, so, uh, so routine is comfortable, it gets boring. Right? The mind needs new connections to stay fresh. Change things up, right? Simple as taking a different route to work. Right? I bet you have choices on how you get to work in the morning. Take a different route. See the world as a different place a little bit. Order something different in the restaurant. We go, there's all, okay, it's true, so there's only five restaurants. Uh, and, and we go there, my wife orders the same thing every time. And so I, I challenge the family, order something different, right? Try something new on the, on, the, on the menu. Just try it. And guess what? It's not like you're ruining your chances forever of never coming after. If you didn't have a good meal, guess what? You learned something at least. You tried something new. And you're going to come back next week, and we'll try something. And we'll say, well, don't try that. Try something else, right? So do something different. Do, t take a different route on your run. Do something, right, to make uh, the world a little different. And you'll be happier, according to research. Flow. 
Okay, bosses out there, uh, supervisors, listen to this, right? Flow is the moment you can think of nothing else but a task at hand and the situation you're immersed in. You ever get in the flow when you're writing something or doing something? This is really happening, right? Uh, right? Uh, it's called in the zone, right? Completely committed to what you're doing, right? Um, this is where the people are always thinking that I'm a multitasker. I can multitask, right? I don't need to do one thing at a time. I can multitask, all right? So they did a study with an uh, experiment with two different groups of people. They randomized. Group number one, they gave the IQ test. Came up 100. Hey, that's average. Group number two, they ran an experiment on. It's just very simple. They gave them the IQ test, but they set up uh, four colored buttons and four colored lights. And while they were taking the test, a beep would happen, beep, and a green light would come on, and then you press the green button. And then take the to beep, and then the oh, red light came on, you press the red button. And they did that during the test. Guess what happened? 20 point drop from an average IQ of 100 to an average IQ of 80, that's borderline learning disabled, right? Uh, so what's the secret? Can you multitask? Yes. Should you multitask? No. Turn your uh, email client off while you're working, right? I'm guessing none of you are heart surgeons and no one will die because that email wasn't returned in the last 15 minutes, right? Uh, I'm guessing. Maybe I'm wrong, right? That's why you have a phone for emergencies, uh, but uh, I bet you can get your stuff done and, oh, another email, doggone it, what's going on over there? You know what I'm saying? And you uh, then focus on that. Turn it off. Get into the flow. You'll do better work faster than you will trying to multitask, right? I know it's not always possible. Dr. Embody, can I have a few minutes? Dr. Embody, can I have a few minutes? Yeah, come on here. The old open door policy. When I'm like, yeah, what's up? I'm just trying to write my board report. I'm in hour seven of a 10 minute report. So come on in, oh, what's up? All right, uh, so I get that. Sometimes you close your door, right? And get some stuff done, but flow works. So don't distract yourself. Put your phone away, turn your email client off, and do the task at hand, and you'll do better work and be happier about it than if you uh, multitask. Create an atmosphere of happiness at work. Okay, supervisors, here are some thoughts for you. Give your employees time off to contribute to the community. So we do Relay for Life. We host it at our place. It takes a lot of time. Maintenance has to set up for it, blah, blah, blah. Why do we do it? I mean, yes, the word community is in our college's name, right? Um, but why do we spend all this time and money um, doing that? Because it's important. It raises the, the happiness level of our employees to be part of something. That's why we do Angel Tree. I mean, we are a foundation. We are a donation, right? We are helping people, but we also help other people help people, right? Uh, we do Angel Tree, all kinds of stuff to help out, right? So allow people to do that. Time off to, I need to go be a watchdog dad or whatever. Give them time off to do that without making them use vacation time. Uh, employee to employee and employee student uh, appreciation and gratitude. I understand you gave away uh, employee of the semester, uh, which is fantastic to a guy in HVAC, which is wonderful. HVAC is important, uh, especially when I got to my office last week and it was 45 degrees in my office. Uh, HVAC is something you'll appreciate, kind of like tap water when it's not there anymore. Uh, right? uh, so what we do in the other show is we do a monthly award uh, for um, uh, where employees and students can nominate in, uh, employee for that and then we decide who gets it and they get a lovely piece of Lucite uh, and 500 bucks uh, and so that encourages more uh, nominations from across campus uh, and so uh, that's been really 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 positive uh, to allow uh, that right uh, so we show well, we give them a chance and then what we do all the nominations go on a card from the president's office and I read and sign every one of them way to go fantastic and I send it out to people who didn't get it, uh, hey, you were nominated. And so who, get, who wins in that? The person who wrote the nomination feels fantastic because they helped someone. The person who received the nomination feels fantastic. They may not have won, but they feel great, right? Uh, and so, and then of course the person who won feels really good, right? But of course that $500 only lasts a short amount of time, right?
and then it's gone, right? Uh, form teams and work together, right? Uh, so working alone is fine. Working together is usually better. Human interaction, better than being alone. Prolonged isolation, depression. Working together, happiness increase. With me? All right? And encourage flow. Tell them to turn off their cell phones. Allow them to do that. Would you like to hear a true story about my former boss? Uh, Vicki Smith. Anybody in here ever meet uh, the former president of the Inchicam Community College? A few of you have. Um, she has sent back every meal she's ever received in any restaurant. Does that tell you who she is in one second? Uh, uh, she, uh, if she were a tool, she'd be a, a bulldozer. Uh, but we, we love probation, so that's exactly the kind of person that we needed, right? The conversation was over, it's time for action, and she was all about that, right? And I was her vice president. Uh, she actually told me uh, when she hired me, have you ever taken the Myers-Briggs test? And I said, sure. She said, what are you? And I said, well, I'm an ENFP. Love me. Right? Uh, I need people who are outgoing, you know. Uh, but she said, oh, you're an F? And I said, yes. You know how people are feeling? And I said, yes. She said, good. I took it. I scored zero on F. <laughs> I have no idea how anyone's feeling, right? Uh, case in point, you have someone walk in. She'd walk by your office and go, those shoes do not go with that outfit. <laughs> I walk away. And so 10 minutes later, I've got a clerk in my office bawling her eyes out, the president hates my shoes. <laughs> OK, I'll handle it. Hey, boss, when you told that girl <laughs> that her shoes were ugly, uh, what were you trying to accomplish? To, oh, well, the shoes did not go with that outfit. I was just trying to help her. She didn't take it that way. Really? No. I was trying to. Oh, should I apologize? That would be a good idea. Okay. And she'd go in there and apologize, right? But that's who she was, right? So uh, we got cell phones at the college. This was a long time ago. Blackberries. Remember Blackberries? First way to get email on your phone was really cool at the time. So she sent me an email, uh, and I didn't respond, right, uh, within a couple of minutes. So she went, uh, she said, went to my office. Secretary said, oh, he's in the bathroom. She went to the bathroom and banged on the door. Are you in there? Yeah, Vicki Smith. Learned a lot from her. Uh, what not to do? But also, uh, she got us off probation. Uh, no doubt about that. She ride the college, and the same kind of aggressiveness, and 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 this is how what we're doing. She did it with the employees. She did it with the board, who was totally malfunctioning board, uh, the worst board in the state at the time. And she basically said, "You are off probation. You will listen to me." Uh, and so. Uh, she took care of it. Now I have the best board ever, uh, but a, a lot of it's roots in her. But here's the thing. Uh, uh, she wanted immediate response to that cell phone. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, unless you're a, it's, it's an emergency call, uh, right? But if it's not, send an email, let people do some flow and get to you when, they, when it's best for them, if you can. Not always, but if you can. Don't take it personally. Don't sit outside the bathroom. Uh, what is happiness? Positive relationships with other people, right? That's what happiness is. Kindness, gratitude, and the capacity for love matter much more than the love of learning, curiosity, accomplishment, or success. So um, I was taught this in a very uh, uh, harsh way. So uh, when my daughter was seven, she had a headache which is unusual for a seven-year-old to get headaches, you know. It'd come and go over a two-week period. And so um, uh, we took her to the, um, to the doctor, and the doctor said, hey, why don't we um, do a CAT scan? I said, a CAT scan? It's a $2,500 test. Are you sure? Well, let's just eliminate some stuff. So we took her in. She got the CAT scan, and then I got the call. Can you come back to the doctor's office? And I said, uh, why? Um, well, there's something on the CAT scan. And when I got there, of course, the wife was uh, beside herself. And so we got there, and I'm, my doctor is in education. But when they slid that uh, film up there, I could read it just fine. Um, she uh, had a golf ball-sized tumor um, here in her head, uh, so large that you know, the brain is symmetrical. It had pressed the brain off symmetrical. Uh, and it had worn through uh, her skull. Her skull was paper thin in that section. And I looked at the pediatrician and said, is she going to make it? And the pediatrician did this. 
Uh, and so that night, we went to um, Children's Mercy, and they checked us in, and I had the 12-year-old intern, you know, uh, that works there. <laughs> and I was stupid, and I asked the question, what are her chances? Now, that's something you should never ask. Uh, you should take one piece of data at a time and act on that, right? But the 12-year-old intern went, I don't know, I'll go look it up. And he came back and said, well, when they present this way, 30% uh, chance of living five years. Okay. Um, so we get into the hospital room, and in walks the um, neurologist, uh, Dr. Hornig. Now, I don't know if you've ever met a neurologist before. These are people who have the ability to drill into a human skull and reach in and do stuff. And so they're a little odd. Uh, do you remember, you remember Christopher Lloyd in Back to the Future? Marty! You know? Um, <laughs> He comes bursting high, and he's got this wild hair, right? Uh, okay, uh, mad scientist kind of hair. And he said, hi, I'm Dr. Horning. We're here to do the operation. And, uh, and then he starts rolling up. Well, you know, I've got to do informed consent. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, here's some things that could happen. Uh, uh, she could uh, go blind. Uh, she could lose the ability to communicate. Uh, she could become a vegetable. Of course, she could die on the table. He's rolling it off like a menu uh, at, you know, at a restaurant. And I can still remember, I believe in post-traumatic stress. Uh, I can, uh, song on the radio remind me of something, and I'm still standing there in that hospital room. I can feel the tile under my feet and how cold I was in that hospital. And st I can still, I'm, I can be there at any time uh, when he's rattling these things off. And that's when I finally lost it, when he was uh, going through what could happen. And so, um, uh, the next day, I kissed my daughter, and they rolled her away for a six-hour surgery. Um, and of course, he said, well, if it's brain cancer, there's not a lot of chance here. It's so big. So after the six hours, uh, he came out and said, well, she's awake and complaining about the catheter, and blah, blah, blah. This is what we did. And I said, can I interrupt you for a minute? Was it cancer? And he went, oh, I probably should have led with that. No. I went, oh. Thank you. You can take her home on Sunday. Uh, so we went from 30% chance to live to, you can take her home on Sunday, she's fine. Uh, it's all taken care of. Take the problems of your life and put them up against the health of your child and see where they come out. Right? And so um, a couple years later, she had problems going to the bathroom. Uh, and we uh, took her in. She had an ovarian tumor. Uh, and it's so large, it's the size of a quart jar. Um, we found that out the day after, um, well, a week after, Vicki Smith uh, resigned. And the board wanted to meet with me to become the new president of the Neosho County. Something I had worked for for 16 years. And earned a doctorate, worked as a dean and a vice president, and here I am at the moment of my life that I'd worked for forever. Do you think I cared one iota about that job? Because if she needed to be closer to KU Med or the Cancer Center, I was going to quit that day, right? So uh, we took her in, uh, had the operation. Turned out it was something called a mature teratoma. That's when the body gets confused and grows the wrong thing. It actually grew a brain and some sweat glands uh, on her ovary. Uh, and they were able to drain it and get it out and cut it apart. And I asked that, uh, the doctor, was it uh, cancer? And she said, no. I know that, because uh, uh, this is a, a KU man. I know this uh, because the pathology class got a hold of it, and they tested it 12 times. It was the coolest tumor they've ever seen. <laughs> so it's been replicated 12 times. It's fine. Uh, to this day, when she does something stupid, I say, which brain did the doctor <laughs> take out? Uh, so uh, I actually um, negotiated my president's contract from her hospital room. If that doesn't put your life in context, I don't know what will. Uh, I like my job very much. I love my daughter. Love matters more than success. Love matters more than accomplishment. And until people figure that out, they're never going to be happy because whatever accomplishment they have will never replace Love. With me on that? Don't let your kid get a tumor to, to, for you to figure that out. 
Uh, so, um, happiness, right? Uh, sorry, you know, that ne negative note. Uh, happiness is achievable. Happiness can be earned, right? Through action, your action of committing yourself to your goals, to committing yourself to other people, for the capacity of love, and to feel grateful for what you have, right? That's my speech. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Brian. What a, what a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I heard Brian do this uh, earlier this year, and, and uh, I love this. It puts a lot of things in perspective. Um, you know, I think, I think happiness is something that we underestimate a lot of the time. Um, I know I, there are days I get up in the morning and drag myself into work uh, when what I should be doing is jumping out of bed and being glad I'm, I'm able to be here. So with that, Brian, thank you again. Let's give, let's give Brian one more round of applause. Let's That concludes the morning's uh, events. Uh, I know we have stuff throughout the rest of the week. Have a great spring semester, and uh, everybody be happy. <laughs>